Okay, so we're nearing the end of having our API working end to end. Let's head on back on over to our handler package and add a new property to our order handler. We'll call this property repo and set the type to be the order.redis repo type we just created. Next, we need to head to our routes.go file in order to make some changes to provide our handler with an instance of the repo. To do this, let's change the load routes methods to be a part of the application struct itself so they can access the properties of the app. Then we need to make the following changes to add a repo to the handler. Once that's done, instead of returning a router in the load routes method, we'll make sure to just assign it to the router of the app now that this function is a method. Next, let's jump on over to our app.go and make the following changes. Okay, now let's integrate this with our handler functions. Let's start with our create handler function first. Let's add in the following imports as we're going to need them in our function. As the handler is expecting a post request with our order data, let's go ahead and define a new variable called body, which has an anonymous type associated. This means its type is without a name and it is declared in line. Our body variable will basically represent our expected post data we receive from the client, which is the customer ID and the line item information. Make sure to also set the JSON tags here as well. Next, we can create a JSON decoder using the json.newDecoder function, which takes our request body as the input. Then we call the decode function, passing in the pointer to our body variable to be decoded into. We should handle any errors here and return a status code of bad request if this fails, as it means we were sent bad input data. Next, let's go ahead and construct our model.order so that we're able to insert it. First, create a variable called now, which is set to time.now.utc. We'll be using this to store our created at in a second. The first field we need to set is our order ID. We can do this by generating a new random number using the math slash rand package. Just as a caveat, this is not something you really want to do in production as you'll eventually run into conflicts with this approach. However, for this tutorial, it's okay. Next, for our line items and our customer ID, we can just assign them over from the body value. Finally, for the created at, take the memory address of the now variable that we created earlier. Next thing to do is to call our repos insert method. The first parameter we need to pass in is the context.context. .context. We can obtain one from our HTTP request using the context method. Now we just need to handle any errors. If one does occur, then we need to send a status code of 500 because something broke on our end. This lets the client know that they can try again with the same parameters. Finally, all that's left is to return our generated model.order to the client. We'll do this by marshalling the order we received from the repo and by writing it to the response writer. We'll also set our response status to be 201, which stands for created. Let's go ahead and test this method out to make sure everything is working as expected. Heading over to a terminal, start up our server and then run the following command to send a request. You can find this command on the GitHub repo for testing, so you don't have to copy it yourself, by the way. If this was successful, we should receive an HTTP status for 201, and we'll see the ID in the response body. We can then copy this ID and open up the Redis CLI. If we call the get command with our order key, we should see that this exists in the database. Perfect. Next, we can test that the ID is in our order set by using the smembers command. And so far, everything is looking good. For the next integration, let's go ahead and implement our list handler function. For this method, we're expecting users to pass in a query parameter for the cursor or page number. We first want to call the get method on the URLs or crest query object for the cursor key. Then we want to add a default case if this cursor is not set. We can do this by setting the cursor to zero if the string is empty. Next, we're going to use the string convert or str conv package to parse our cursor into a uint64. If this fails, then it's likely because somebody was sending a non-numeric cursor. So we'll go ahead and send an HTTP bad request in that instance and return early. Next, we get to call our repos find all method. Let's use the requests context as the first parameter and set up our find all page properties. We'll set a default size of 50 and pass in the cursor as well. As usual, we'll want to handle any errors here. Next, it's time to craft our response. We'll do this again with an anonymous struct. Inside of this struct, we'll have an items field which will store our orders and a value for the next, which is the next cursor to use. You'll notice we've added an omit empty to our next JSON tag. What this does is omit the field if there's an empty value, which in the case of a uint64 is zero. This is something we'll want as it will allow us to signal that there are no more pages for the client to page through. 
Next, we assign our response struct values from our repo's result before marshalling it into JSON and writing it back to the client. Now we can check out if this is working. If we run this against our single database entry, so far so good. Let's test this with a larger amount of records, however. I've created a quick script to add 120 records via our post request, which you can find in the scripts directory on GitHub. If we test our code now, we can see that we successfully get our next cursor. And if we make a request with it, it'll paginate across our results until we no longer have any pages left. Very cool. Okay, let's go ahead and implement our next method, the getById function. First things first, go ahead and import these two packages as we're going to need them in the function. For this method, we need to pull out the order ID from the path parameter. We can do this with chi using the chi URL param method, which takes our request and the key of the ID we're looking for. As we specified a URL param of ID in the route, then that's the key we need to use. Once we pull out the key, we need to convert it to a uint64 using our familiar string convert function again, or sending back a status of bad request if this fails to pass. With our older ID in place, we can now call our repositories find by ID function, again using our requests context as the context parameter. Here we can then handle any errors that come back. However, we first want to check if it's our custom error that we created earlier, which describes if an order doesn't exist for the ID. If that's the case, then we want to return a 404, or status not found. Otherwise, we can assume that there was a server caused error and return a status of internal server error, or 500. Lastly, if everything worked as expected, we just need to write our order model to our response. We're going to do it a little bit differently in this method and use the JSON encoder type to encode directly into our response writer. We'll also handle any errors in case this fails. Now, if we jump over to our terminal window, we can send up a request to our order ID and get back the expected response. If we try this with an order ID that doesn't exist, we will receive a 404. Perfect. Now it's time for us to implement our largest handler method, update by ID. There's going to be a lot of code in this one, but it's pretty much what we've seen with both our create and get by ID handlers already, just kind of merged together. First things first, as this is a put request, we'll be expecting some body data. For this method, we're only going to be able to update the status of the order to either shipped or completed. Therefore, we need to define another body struct to capture this, similar to what we did with our create method. With our struct defined, we can then decode this from our request's body. Afterwards, we then need to pull out the order ID, basically the same as what we did with our get by ID method from the path parameter. And afterwards, we can pull out the existing order and handle any errors if it doesn't exist or if the operation fails. Now we're on to some custom business logic. Here we need to only allow updating our order if there's certain conditions met. First, we'll set two constants for our status strings, shipped and completed. And let's capture the timestamp for use in our status cases. Now we can move on to checking these. Let's perform a switch case on our new order status and check it against our order's timestamp. First, let's check the shipped status case. We only want to set this if our shipped app timestamp is nil. Otherwise, let's return a status bad request. For the completed status case, in this event, we only want to set it if we've shipped our order but have yet to complete it. So our completed at should be nil and our shipped at should be not nil. If neither of these are true, then let's return a bad request status. Lastly, we'll add a default case for any status strings that we're not expecting, sending back a bad request in this case. Now we can go ahead and call the update method of our repo with our updated order model. And if everything is working as expected, send it back down to our client encoded as JSON. Okay, that's a large function. Let's go ahead and test this out. If we test upgrading the status of our order to shipped, it works as expected. And we can see the new shipped at timestamp. If we try and set the same order to shipped again, it should fail with a status bad request. Next, let's set the status to completed. This now also works as expected, and we can see the completed at timestamp has been populated. Okay, let's create a new order and see if we can set this straight to completed. We get a 400 back as expected. Finally, let's try and set our status to some garbage. We'll also get an error back here as well. So far, this is looking great. Although one thing we could do to improve on this would be to send back an error description when we do encounter a status bad request. This can help the client to understand what they did incorrectly and to try and resolve it. I'm going to leave this as an exercise to you, however. The last handler method to implement is going to be our easiest at this stage, 
and that is the delete by ID method. This is almost a complete copy of our get by ID method, except the only difference is we're calling the delete by ID function of our repo rather than the find by ID method. As we've seen this all before, I'm going to speed run this implementation. Now we can go ahead and test it. Opening up another terminal window, if we send a delete request to our order, we can then check if it exists by sending a subsequent get request for the ID. And we can see here we now receive a 404. With that, we have our handlers implemented end to end, and we're almost done with our API. There's one last thing I think is worthwhile for us to go over, however, and that is configuration. We've made some assumptions so far that both our server port and Redis port are both able to run on 3000 and 6379, respectively. However, in the real world, you'll sometimes need to configure these values, as well as other things such as passwords or API keys. So we're going to finish off this tutorial by setting up some light configuration for both our server port and our Redis address. Let's first commit the code we've currently got in order to prevent accidentally deleting it. Now if we jump on over to our application package, let's create a new file called config.go. Open it up and add in the package name at the top, which is application. Inside let's create a new struct called config. Here we can use this as our application's main configuration. Next add in the following two properties to the struct. The first one being the Redis address and the second one being the server port. Now we can add a new function called loadconfig, which returns an instance of our configuration. There are a couple of packages that can provide this configuration loading for us, such as viper or envconfig, but we're going to do this manually so we can get a better understanding of what they're doing under the hood. Inside of this function, we want to first create an instance of our config with some default values. We'll set these to be the same values we currently have set, which is port 3000 for our server host and localhost 6379 for our Redis address. Next, we're going to load any configuration from environment variables. To do this, we first need to import the OS package. Then in the load config method, we can call the OS lookup env function on the mvar of Redis adder, which returns two variables. The first is the mvar value, which is a string. And the second is a boolean that tells us whether the variable exists or not. We can wrap this in an if statement and only override our default variable if it exists. Let's do the same thing for the server port. We'll also need to pass this from a string to an integer, then just return the config at the end. Now head on over to our app.go and add the config to our app struct. Then we'll add a config parameter to our constructor and inside of it we'll use it to set our Redis address in the Redis options. Finally, head down to the start method and replace our hard-coded server port with the one from our application config. Next, we just need to load this config and pass it through. We can do this in our main.go function. Now we can change our server port easily using the nvar. Let's jump to our terminal and test this out. If we set our server port nvar to be 8080 and run our code, we should then be able to send a request to this new server port and get a response back. As you can see, this is working as expected. And that's it, we now have a working API microservice up and running. In case you need them, you can find all of the project files on my GitHub. That way you can see how I've done things in the event you get stuck. A link should be in the description. There are a few things that I have left unfinished. And in case you want to keep extending this code, then these are the things I'd recommend to do. The first thing would be to add in the go.env package to automatically load our configuration from a .env file. The second thing would be to think about moving the repo, handler and model packages into a single order package. We have an order package already defined and started inside of the repository directory. You could move this out and group all of the types together and group them by the domain. The third thing I'd recommend is afterwards replacing the references to the repo and our handler with a Go interface. This will allow you to swap this out to another data store in the future. Number four is swapping it out to another data store. I'd recommend looking at creating a new repository for Postgres and storing the order data in there. Then following the interface change, you can try and swap this out and see if everything continues to work. The last thing I'd recommend trying is to add some automated end-to-end -end testing for this. This one is probably quite challenging, but having these tests will get you thinking about using your API as a client, which can help you with the developer experience. Otherwise, Thank you for watching and I hope you learned something new on this video.